these sessions in the auditorium and uh, much easier to have sort of questions than answers. Um, what we're going to try to do is we'll introduce ourselves and then, you know, there are, we've been doing this enough um, over the years that there's general topics that people always ask about. So we'll just, you know, talk about different things. If you do have a question, um, you can put it in the chat. Um, we may not answer specific questions, but if there are like general themes, you know, then we'll have somebody try to address um, those. I would say that, you know, this is probably not a great form if you have a question that is very specific about your own personal care and those things are better just jot them down and take them in with you to your next office visit or you can usually reach us by my chart messaging if you have that. Um, but uh, thank you guys all for coming and hopefully you'll find this helpful. I think we'll just start with introducing ourselves and um, Jermaine, you're in, I don't know if everybody has the same view, but you're in my upper left corner. So I'm starting with you. <laughs> I'm Jermaine Earl Crookshanks and I'm at the Mount Auburn Practice for Women at Fresh Pond office. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. I've been here for about 12 years. And I'm Leslie McDonald. I'm also in the um, Fresh Pond office in Cambridge. Um, I have been here for a little over 20 years. Um, Annie, you're next. Hi, I'm Annie Leo. I'm at MIT Medical. I've been uh, the other Annie. for over 30 years. And I'm Fana Wasserman. I'm also at MIT Medical. Um, they only give us one camera, so that's why we're sharing. Uh, <laughs> and um, I've been here for more than 20 years. Hi, um, I'm Annie Antonellis. Um, I am one of the other docs at Fresh Pond, um, and this is my third year at Mount Auburn. How about Taylor? I'm Taylor Hotchkiss. I am um, presently the only doc at the Mill Street office in Arlington, soon to be joined by Kelly Nichols. Um, I have been here for um, nine years. Marianne. Hi, I'm Marianne Dulwich, and I am at the office in Waltham on Waverly Oaks Road. Luke. Hi, I'm Luke Chapman. I'm also at the Waverly Oaks office, and I'm also at um, the Charles River Community Health Centre in Brighton. Steph. Hi, I'm Stephanie Kuntz, and I've been at Mount Auburn since 2004, um, and I am now mostly at the hospital, so I'm on labor and delivery a little more than, than average, and I'm also at the Community Health Center, the Charles River Community Health Center in Waltham. And we have a couple other um, docs who work as hospitalists where they don't work in the office, but they do cover labor and delivery who aren't here yet. Hopefully they'll be joining us um, soon, uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I think, you know, if you think of things that might be good general topics, go ahead and put them in the chat and maybe Taylor and Luke, you guys did a really good job last time of monitoring that. So, um, you know, if you don't mind doing that, that would be great. Um, but I guess maybe Jermaine, I'll start with you. Do you wanna just talk about what people should do when they think they're in labor? Sure. So <clears throat> the first thing to do when you think you're in labor and all of the signs of labor are something that you should, you know, get from the classes and talk to your primary provider about. Um, you should always call the office that you come from and you should, during the day, speak to someone in the office. Usually um, you'll get a front staff member and if there's an issue, they will send a message to the nurse who will call you promptly back. Um, if it's after hours, wait for the service to pick up and once they pick up, let them know what's going on and you, they, they will page the on-call doctor. We are doing a lot of things in the hospital we're in the ER, we're in the operating room, we're doing deliveries. And so for some reason, we don't get back to you within 15, 20 minutes, certainly call again. Um, obviously, you know, if you think it's an absolute emergency, you can be on your way, but certainly call on the way. And we prefer you call before. It's really for nurse staffing, patient safety, et cetera. Um, entering the hospital, you can enter the main entrance until 9 p.m. Between 9 p.m. and I think 
five. I always forget the morning is it's through the ER. And I promise you, as soon as they see you, they will direct you to the correct place. Sorry, muted myself. Um, Taylor, do you want to maybe just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the way COVID has has um, changed or affected some of the things that we do in terms of later in pregnancy, what people should be thinking about, and then also like testing and screening and everything when they come to the hospital? Sure. Um, you guys have probably all seen an evolution in our protocols over the course of your pregnancy, um, but as you're nearing the end of pregnancy and nearing your due date, we'll be talking about doing a COVID test as a screen um, before you get to the hospital, if possible. If we know that we've got something scheduled, um, like an induction of labor or a C-section or even a aversion attempt to try to get a breech baby to flip to head down, we will set up a COVID test in advance of you coming to the hospital for that appointment. If you arrive at the hospital in spontaneous labor and haven't had a COVID test yet, we will do that on labor and delivery. And if we're just anticipating that you go, will go into labor soon, the nurse in the office will set you up for a COVID test. Um, so again, trying to catch people before they hit the hospital, but we can still do the test at the hospital if necessary. We are screening everyone verbally um, for symptoms of lungitis um, that could be consistent with COVID. So, um, especially for your support person, you know, if they screen negative, don't have any symptoms, they don't actually have to get tested. But if they are feeling unwell, we would recommend that you find an alternate person to support you in labor. Um, it's important for us to know your COVID status because it does play a role in um, decisions about how to manage you, um, specifically say you develop a fever in labor and we're trying to figure out what's going on, what's the cause of the fever, and we'd like to be able to kind of take COVID out of the picture if we can. Um, the visitor policy has changed a lot over the course of COVID. Um, where we stand right now, you can have two support people in labor. Um, so people generally will pick their partner and um, another support person that may be related to them or a friend or a doula. A doula will count as your um, second support person. And a doula is um, basically just a labor coach, somebody to support you um, in labor in addition to your primary person. On <clears throat> postpartum, your primary person can stay with you um, and spend the night. And the most recent change to protocols is that if they need to leave, so you have older children that they need to check on, they can leave the hospital and still come back and stay the night with you at the hospital. You may have, and this is going to evolve, but right now you can have um, one visitor, um, I believe per day, or are we saying per visiting hour window, Leslie? I think it's one per day yeah. during the visitor, during yeah. those set hours. 12 to two or five to seven, so one per day. Um, and that person does need to be um, a 12 and up. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, as with any, you know, big, uh, illness scare, which there are, you know, historically, not just COVID, um, little kids can't come in. Um, so they will welcome you back when you do return home with a new baby. Um, and well, also, did out. you mention that if the partner leaves, they have to be the visitor? I don't know if that was mentioned. No, that's actually the newest change, um, Jermaine. Oh, so it's just my bad. now changing. Um, <laughs> So it's a nice change because, of course, people with small children have really, you know, been frustrated by that, that rule. And again, it's just out of an abundance of caution. We're just trying to keep everybody, patients, partners, babies, and staff as healthy and safe as possible. So they now can leave and come back and stay the night. I think it still makes sense to really think about limiting, um, you know, the number of people who come and go just for your own safety, your baby's safety, and everybody around. So, and it's also something to think about when you go home from the hospital, um, because everybody still wants to come and see the baby and, you know, um, you, you know, we're in this time of discovery about how effective the vaccines are what does it mean if a mom did get vaccinated during pregnancy does that afford any immunity to babies but there's so many things that we just don't know 
Um, so, you know, kind of that two weeks before you are, your due date is a good time to really try to limit your exposures in terms of, you know, going out and about and being certainly in crowded places and you want to continue to do all the things that we're, we're all supposed to do in terms of masking and social distancing and washing your hands, just so that you didn't pot take the chance of getting sick right around the time of labor. And then, you know, I've also been telling my patients to really be cautious when they go home as well just because you know it's a time where we still we know a lot more than we did a year ago but there's still a lot we don't know yeah i think leslie there's two other things i, I wanted to mention about covid protocols yeah. we still are asking um, people to wear masks throughout um but so patients and um partners and you will not be separated from your baby so even if you get covid um if you're actively infected in moments where you're not actively breastfeeding, we will ask you to keep the baby in the isolate, which is just basically a little plastic um, bed that the baby says and, and wheels, um, about six feet away from you so that you know the baby's not being exposed to unnecessarily to your respiratory droplets. Um, and we'll ask you to keep your mask on when you're holding your baby. Again, just trying to protect the baby when it's um, brand new, when you are actively contagious or infectious, um, but we will not separate you from your baby. Um, the other thing that always comes up um, just in general is kind of the idea of a birth plan. And I don't know, Annie, if you want to take that on about whether people should create a birth plan or how they go about thinking about that. Yeah. So this, um, regarding the birth plan or the birth preference, um, it's been brought up sometimes like during the um, birthing class or um, some of the websites. And usually, whether you have the birth plan or not at the hospital, the hospital staff, the nursing staff will um, have the conversation and ask what your birth preference might be. And it's always kind of good to have some conversation. And if you would like to have the birth plan uh, or birth preference like in a writing, we also welcome that. Usually the recommendation is that to have the um, done ahead of time, and then you go in for the follow-up prenatal visit, have some uh, discussion to go over the birth plan, the birth person chart, so that we know all the details and have some discussion whether uh, uh, there's any modification. And then after discussion, just modify and then kind of bring back the form. And it's good to have one copy with you when you come in so that uh, all the staff will take care of you uh, we'll be able to look at the birth plan of birth preference. Like, um, sometimes there's some templates that uh, the hospital uh, or the office uh, have that you can ask, ask for if, if you need to, but it's not necessary to, to always have to make a birth plan. So that's my opinion. Thank you. I think the only other thing I would add to that is that you know, it's great to think, spend some time thinking about what might work for you and what you want, um, but also recognize that labor and delivery is sort of a very flexible, fluid thing where things can change. And I think, you know, everybody is really good about talking to people and explaining what's going on. So hopefully there won't be any surprises, but there may be times where we have to, you know, veer from what your preferences might be, but we're always going to work to explain that to everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add about that. I think the only other thing I would add is if you have a plan for postpartum um, contraception, that if you decided that you want an IUD, it's super helpful to mention that to us, you know, kind of up front when you're coming in and, you know, or you know, sometime during the labor process so that we can have that prepared um, for the labor process if that is in your birth plan for afterwards. I think another thing that people are always curious about is just um, kind of different options for pain management in labor. Um, Annie Antonellis, you want to do that? 
Sure. Um, so we have lots of options to help support you um, through labor. Labor is painful. That is the reality of it. Um, and so, you know, some people um, like to avoid pain medications, which is totally reasonable. Um, I tell my patients, if that's something that you're hoping for, you want to make sure you have a plan for what you're going to do to cope with the pain otherwise. Um, you know, labor is a... Um, a challenging sort of course and so it'd be like showing up to a marathon not training if you didn't have any sort of plan to to manage pain um, and so there's lots of different ways that people um, sort of prepare, prepare to try and labor without any pain medications there's hypnobirthing mindfulness and labor lamas um, and so you know if that's something you're planning on or hoping for you want to look into those and sort of see if there's a, a method that you think would work for you um, if you uh, are not interested in avoiding pain medications, and we also have medicines um, to help as well, um, you know, sort of starting off, we, you know, when you are in labor, you can be up and move around your room. We have wireless um, fetal monitors, so you don't have to be attached to things. Um, we do intermittent monitoring as much as we can. Um, we have birthing balls. Um, there's some sort of water option in every room. There's a, I can never remember, one or two of the rooms only have a shower and then there are tubs in the rest of the rooms. Um, so hydrotherapy during labor can be really helpful um, to help with pain. Um, and then sort of getting into pain medications, um, we have nitrous oxide. Um, that's a gas that you inhale, so it's a little mask um, that you uh, have to control yourself as the patient. Um, you inhale it during contractions and then you sort of breathe normal air in between. You do have to have a negative COVID test within seven days um, to be able to use that because it is a little bit of an aerosolizing um, process. Um, and most people who that works well for sort of say, it doesn't really take away the pain, but it kind of makes me not care that I'm having pain. So it's a little bit more of kind of like an anti-anxiety or relaxation type of medication, as opposed to a direct pain med. Um, and then we have some IV pain medications, just strong pain medication. You get a little bit in the shot and a little bit in your IV, and that sort of takes the edge off of the pain that you're having, helps you feel a little bit more relaxed. People say it feels like you had a glass of wine sometimes. So you can sort of rest in between contractions, and then the, the intensity of the contraction is a little less than it was without that pain medicine. And then we have um, epidurals. And so our anesthesia team is in-house 24 hours. They are doing other things. So it doesn't mean they're sort of just sitting there waiting for, for all of our patients as much as we wish that they were. Um, but they are there in the hospital. So generally there's not a huge wait um, if you want and request an epidural. Um, and epidurals are, um, they place a catheter into the space around your spine and has a continuous infusion of pain medication. And it sort of numbs you up from your ribs to your you know, pubic bone so you don't feel your contractions as much as possible you know nothing is perfect in this world but that's sort of the goal um, but still feel sort of pelvic pressure vaginal pressure often still feel baby's delivery although not quite as intense as it might be without an epidural so there's sort of a whole gamut of things that we are happy to support you in whatever um, kind of makes sense for you um, and I think you know it's good to be sort of similar to the birth plan um, I think thinking about it and thinking about what you want is um, important, but remembering that you, you know, it's a, every labor is different. And so being flexible and kind of being open and knowing what those options are is important. Great. Thanks. Um, maybe Michelle, since you didn't, weren't here when you, when we all introduced ourselves, you, maybe you could introduce uh, yourself and maybe talk a little bit about what um, people might expect, like, after they have the baby, how long they're going to stay, whether they have a vaginal delivery or C-section, that kind of thing. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Finkel. I am one of the docs at Fresh Pond um, Women's Health um, with Dr. Antonellis and Dr. Kuchank and Dr. McDonald. Um, so you know, the, the length of stay following your delivery can vary um, a, by a few days, depending on your labor course. If you have a vaginal delivery, typically you will stay for two days after the delivery. If you were to deliver after 8 p.m., um, so super late on, in one night, um, you can actually leave on the third day. Um, C-sections will usually stay till post-op day four. 
Uh, we have had some people request earlier discharges with COVID, um, and that can vary from person to person and depend on how many kids you have home and what else you're juggling um, with your family. Um, pediat from a pediatric standpoint, I think that they want to monitor the babies for at least 24 to 36 hours to make sure that they are um, doing all the things they need to do um, to get them home and be, you know, okay to be there um, from a weight standpoint, breastfeeding, um, and um, all of that other stuff. Um, I think, you know, in the postpartum time frame, it is nice to spend some time in the hospital, especially if you're a first time mom. We have lactation support available daily, which is really useful. And I would recommend using that if you're going to decide to breastfeed. Um, it's also nice to just get help, um, tips and nurses are a wealth of information um, from everything from, you know, changing a diaper to bathing your little one. Um, and then also for, you know, C-section recovery, it's nice to be there um, and, and have some, you know, support initially um, and, you know, make sure your pain is well managed before you go home. Okay. Okay. Yeah, somebody in the chat asked about a visitor being under the age of 12 and they they will not allow children. Um, so no, under the age of 12, they will not um, allow. Um, let's see, uh, maybe Stephanie, do you wanna take, you know, the sort of looking for a pediatrician, maybe circumcision? roll that into something. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's very important to have already picked out your pediatric practice before delivery, and it makes it much smoother in terms of the baby's care if you do that. Um, the most of the pediatricians in the area don't come to the hospital to see your baby, and that's absolutely fine. We have pediatricians um, they're at the hospital all the time. They come to delivery when we need help or when babies need transition help. And they're helping um, the newborn care in the days that the babies are there. So we've got it covered there, but you want to pick someone out ahead of time. Um, you can always start with talking to your um, primary obstetrician in the office. Um, and we always have recommendations of people in the area. And of course, um, friends and family are, are also good sources. Um, so that's very helpful and important. Um, and then when you deliver your baby and your baby's in the nursery, the pediatrician at the hospital will help coordinate a plan for when you're supposed to make your appointment with the pediatrician and give advice. And if there's anything other than straightforward, they'll be happy to um, be talking directly to your pediatrician who's going to be taking care of the baby later. Um, for boys, um, when you're planning on having a boy, there's a, a decision that you might make about whether to have your baby boy circumcised or not. Um, it's an elective procedure. It's something you want to think about ahead of time. We give people information in the office regarding the risks and benefits. Um, overall, it really is a pretty neutral decision. There's some nuances there that you can talk about with your obstetrician, or if you already have a pediatrician, can talk to them about it. Um, and um, But but if you choose to have it, we're happy to help facilitate that in the hospital. It's usually done once the baby is um, 24 hours old or more. And with the pediatrician clearance at the hospital, they've already evaluated your baby and, and said that it would be okay to go ahead. And that's a, a decision that you make um, and our consented for that specifically in the hospital so you know exactly who's doing the procedure and when they're doing it. Most days now the uh, the pediatrician in the hospital 
um, does the procedure, but there are some days, especially some weekend days, where the obstetrician might be doing it. So whoever's doing it that day, they'll come talk to you if they've found out that you're interested in having that. And roughly about half of the baby boys in our hospital are circumcised and half aren't, so very common either way, um, and something that you just want to decide ahead of time. Great. Um, maybe Marianne, there is a question in the um, chat about cord blood collection. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that and in, in um, including whether somebody has a vaginal delivery or C-section? Sure. Um, regarding cord blood collection, that's also something uh, to consider during the pregnancy and um, you know, there can be some benefits. Again, probably best to talk to the, your individual OB for a little bit more information, but um, essentially at this point, uh, families that would like to do a cord blood collection should look into some of the private companies. There are a number of companies that um, can be discovered online that, that offers these services uh, with a fee um, and then storage fees and collection fees, et cetera. Um, the company will send the kits and if uh, that is something that you're planning on doing, just uh, you know, bring the kit with you to the hospital um, and let the delivery team know that the plan is for a cord blood collection. Um, we're all, you know, we've all done them uh, with deliveries. They can be completed with a vaginal delivery or a cesarean delivery. Um, the equipment is kept in sterile packages. So uh, at the time when the, the baby's going to be born, then those packages can be opened and we're able to um, collect the cord blood. Um, most of the time we can get a good sample. However, you know, there are, you know, just to be aware that um, it's not 100% guarantee to get a ton of blood. And this can vary depending on how quickly, you know, the, the placenta may release and how much blood may be available. Um, but we do try to get the blood collected uh, as you know as soon as possible to maximize the amount that we can that we can do. Uh, the company then will, you know, sort of uh, give instructions as far as handling and picking up uh, the sample following the delivery. Great. Um, also, I just sorry about that. I like yep. that we can't sure. do delayed cord clamping if we're going to collect because it's sort of one or the other in terms of where the blood goes directly to the baby or stored for maybe the baby later. Yeah, that, that is a good point that if we do delay for a minute, um, then by the time, you know, we clamp and start the cord blood collection that uh, that can definitely affect how much blood we're able to collect. Also, I'll just add, I think the question also involved whether it was a C-section or vaginal birth, and I don't think it matters. It's completely okay. fine for either or. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that there's probably a few questions or people have um, thoughts or maybe some worries about COVID vaccine during pregnancy. Um, Luke, maybe do you want to just talk a little bit about what people should think about around making those decisions if they haven't already done it? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think people have had an awful lot of questions very justifiably about the vaccine, about testing, about data which is available. Um, and, you know, the vaccines that we're currently using have not had years and years worth of testing, as we've seen with many other vaccinations. That said, um, we have seen that the studies that have been done have been very reassuring and they've also shown that these vaccines are actually very effective in vaccine terms. We're talking about efficacy rates of like 95 percent which is above the around 70 percent that we expect from most other vaccinations. So we're encouraged by that. Um, in terms of use in the general population we have seen that people have done very 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 well. We've seen very few significant side effects. I think a lot of people have experienced an aching arm, some headaches, some little bit of GI disturbance. And people who have been exposed and properly infected with COVID earlier on have found that when they have the vaccination, 
that they have a more pronounced response. And the patients that we've known, the colleagues that we've known who have been previously exposed have found that yes, they've had more of a response, particularly feverishness as well for a first day or two, although those things do resolve very quickly and people do very well. It also tends to be that that second vaccination has produced a little bit more in terms of side effects than the first. And certainly when people have not been exposed before, their body does very little with the first, but then develops a response with the second, which is what we expect is what we want. So then people doing very, very well, the question has come up, okay, well, what about pregnancy? And so people appreciate that in general terms, we don't do an awful lot of studies of medications in pregnancy, and there's a lot of uncertainty. When we do, do test medications, we tend to test them on non-pregnant patients, and then we say, gosh, you know, do we see any effects in pregnant patients who then have taken those medications? So in the studies which were done to start with, we did see a number of people get pregnant, and they did very well with COVID vaccination. But those were unintended, and that was not specifically studied that way. We've now seen a lot of women who have elected to take vaccination in pregnancy, and we've seen them do very well, and we've seen babies do very well. We've seen a number of babies then be delivered and be tested and also show antibodies as well. So those babies are protected for around about the first six months of life, which is also very valuable. So in terms of the guidelines at this point, we say, you know what, this data is not absolutely perfect in those terms, but everything that we've seen is reassuring to the point that when we talk about guidelines from the CDC, from ACOG, our governing body, from our maternal fetal medicine colleagues who are taking care of a lot of people in pregnancy, they say, on balance, people seem to do very well. We believe it's very safe. And the general recommendation is that we ought to consider it. And probably for most pregnant patients, it is the appropriate thing to do. And the balance here is talking about people who might get infected in pregnancy if we didn't vaccinate them as well. And realizing that what we've seen is that a lot of pregnant patients who have become infected have done very well. We haven't seen as many people end up in ICUs and need a lot of support as, for example, we've seen in previous bad flu seasons where there have been particular strains which have affected pregnant patients. But we have seen a few people get genuinely sick. And we have seen that even after that, there are probably a lot more people who have more subtle effects that we didn't initially notice either. People who find that their oxygen level goes down as they sleep and they need some more oxygen support, which is not something that we saw at the start of you know, all of COVID. But as we've started to go away from people getting really sick, we've noticed more of these subtle effects. So those people we have been admitting sometimes and we have been giving them oxygen and monitoring very closely. And we do worry about impacts that those things have, although we haven't seen lots of significant impacts yet. So on balance, the risks of becoming infected and the consequences of those things on the pregnancy versus the impacts that we've seen of vaccination, we've seen that people have done very well. And so we think based on the guidelines that it's appropriate to vaccinate people in pregnancy, particularly people also who have diabetes or who have other medical issues going on in pregnancy, which might put them even more slightly at risk. Those people we definitely encourage. And those were the people who were one of the first group of people beyond acute healthcare workers and so on to be recommended to be vaccinated and have access. So it's still something I think that if you're thinking about it, the first step is to honestly talk to one of us in clinic and have a conversation and we can tell you exact up-to-date information as things change and they change and they change as we get more information as there are more studies as there are more outcomes we can tell you about those things and you can bring us the things that you're thinking the questions that you have the worries that you have and we can talk through those things together so at this point the recommendation is yeah it's probably the right thing to do but please talk to us about it and and let us go through those things with you as with most things in pregnancy and um and as we go forward work those things out on a, a kind of personal one-to-one -one basis 
Great, thanks. Um, Hannah, maybe you don't mind talking. There was a question in the chat um, about if someone was having twins, maybe some things that they should be thinking about before coming into labor and delivery. I mean, I do think that that's going to be a pretty specific conversation, but there might be some general things that you might um, share for anybody having twins. So I think for twins, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> a little bit more complicated, but um, a lot of fun in the house afterwards. Um, so I think for, for twins, um, the main things are going to be us trying to figure out what the positions are of the babies, figure out your birth plan once you come into the hospital. So we'll be you know, checking an ultrasound. So this is all much more specific for twins. Um, even for singletons, we also check the position of the baby, make sure that the baby's head down when you're first in labor. So we'll be confirming that usually with an ultrasound or with an exam. Um, so that kind of is, is similar in both regards. Um, for twins, we do have twin monitors, so we're able to monitor both babies at the same time. Um, and for your postpartum stay, nothing really changes. It's still the same as with singletons. You get the two days for a vaginal birth and the four days for a C-section. Um, so not much really changes with twins, except that you need two car seats coming in and you need to have, you know, more outfits going out. So, um, but the, you know, the main thing is going to be the uh, ongoing conversations with your provider about the delivery mode. And, you know, there is a little bit more uncertainty in terms of that second twin, whether or not it's going to come out vaginally or by C-section. Um, and those kinds of decisions are going to be a little bit more, you know, specific um, for your situation. I think the other thing that, um, you know, with twins, um, many people would probably encourage you to consider an epidural, even if maybe you weren't otherwise, just because sometimes, uh, like Hannah said, how that second twin comes down, there may be the need for a little more manipulation or intervention and having the um, mom uh, as comfortable as we can have them and, and relaxed is um, helpful. Uh, so it's that again is that like not everybody has to have it, but it's something that I think frequently comes up. Um, and so it's a good conversation to have and to think about ahead of time. Um, I see that Maureen Whalen joined us. So Maureen, do you want to introduce yourself? And then there was a question in the chat about uh, maybe like what a doula is, what the role of a doula is, and how somebody might go about finding one. I'll, I'll let you talk about that after you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Maureen Whalen. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry to be late. Um, so I'm a, I'm a hospitalist for the practice. So I am uh, in the hospital quite a bit covering labor and delivery. And I cover both the blue and the gold team, but I'm dominantly the gold team for the next two months. That's why I'm joining the gold meeting. Um, a doula is a, a support person. Um, they may or may not have formal training in labor and delivery. Um, there are no definite requirements for them to have that. Um, they, uh, I believe right now, can be with you um, throughout your labor and delivery. The only place we're not allowing our doulas right now is in the operating room. Um, if you end up needing a C-section, um, they can be very helpful. Studies show that the more support you have in labor, the, uh, the higher the incidence of vaginal delivery and you know, positive outcomes overall. Um, in terms of where to find a doula, I would have to say I do not know. Um, <laughs> there's a bunch of them that you know seem quite good. I know there are networks. I would suspect that those physicians that work in the office more would have a little bit more information um, about different doula organizations um, or groups of doulas. I, I don't honestly know. There's, there's no certification to be a doula. So there's no board that you can go to and say, is this person, you know, it's, it's more of a support person for you. We have a list in our office, Maureen. I okay. don't know about other offices, but we can hand out a list. I don't know if there's that list somewhere else, Leslie. Yeah. There's also that a um, doula international, um, uh, there's like an international association of doulas that um, is a sort of great central place that you can just Google and, and uh, find. Um, 
There was also a question about what's the difference between blue and gold, um, which, uh, you know, basically we have two groups of doctors. So there's another, just like this group is the gold group, there's another group of doctors that is some of the Mount Auburn practice doctors, the Atreus docs um, form another group. Um, and one of the nice things about that, so, you know, just like we're here and one of us will be on call at the time that you come in and labor, they have their group of patients and one of them will also be on call, which is very nice because that means that at, for 24 hours each day, there's two docs on call. Um, so always there's two of us there. Um, there's also the midwifery group has their own um, practice, so they see patients just like we see our patients and they care for their own patients on labor and delivery. And so there are two midwives also on call um, for any 24 hours, which is great because it gives us a little bit of depth in case two things are happening at once. So occasionally, you know, we might, doesn't happen very often. It is really common that we have more than one patient in labor at a time, but it's all, it's not very common that everybody's at the exact same stage in labor. Um, so, but it is nice to know that if we are in doing a delivery and somebody else progresses and is ready to deliver, that there is another doc and there's a couple of midwives. So there's another provider who can step in if that um, is needed. Um, also, if somebody needs a C-section, uh, typically both doctors, the doctors would perform the C-section. There are some of our midwives who are trained to first assist, so sometimes a midwife will help us. Um, but again, during that time frame, if somebody else were to progress and go on and need to be um, delivering, there's, there's always um, layers of backup there, so that's good to know. Um, there's a question, um, let's see, and, oh, I guess we answered that. Any other questions that people have, or if you guys as panelists think of something that... I just wanted to, about, yeah. I just wanted to mention, um, going on to what you were saying, so on the postpartum, so you talk about the labor and delivery part, and then just on postpartum, there is a nurse practitioner oh, who's yeah. doing the rounding for us. Um, so typically, as long as you are doing well and there's no, um, com there were no complications in labor, really, and, and your recovery is going smoothly, then we have a nurse practitioner from the offices um, who comes and they, they are assigned to round on all the patients on both blue and gold um, teams. Um, so, so we do have that as support for afterwards, and then you'll also have, you know, the lactation support and all the other things that go on on postpartum. Um, if you have complications that are happening, the providers, the docs on labor delivery will come over and see you as well as needed. Um, and so, you know, so, so we are around and we are available, but we primarily are spending our time on labor and delivery. Um, we have maybe just maybe not quite 15 minutes left. I don't know. I'm happy for people to jot any questions that they have. Um, we will uh, at the end go through and reintroduce ourselves just so that you know who everybody is and where we are. And I don't, again, I don't know if the panelists have any other thoughts about things that we typically talk about that we didn't. Circumcision. Ah, yes. Um, I think somebody talked a little bit. We talked yeah. a little bit about it. Um, I see it was memorable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a question about pre-registration at the hospital, and um, that is no longer necessary um, because we're all now on the same electronic record, um, the outpatient offices and the um, hospital. Um, and so once you're seeing a patient or seeing a provider in one of the Mount Auburn offices, you're automatically registered. Hannah and Annie, I think that that also, what happens for the MIT patients? Our, our patients are, most of our patients are being seen at Mount Auburn, at least for their 12 week ultrasound. So you're getting registered in the system in that way. Um, I also saw in the chat, um, someone's asking about 
what typically happens when patients go into labor while out of town. Um, so, you know, your insurance will most likely cover you for an out of town delivery if it was an emergency. So, if you were 29 weeks or 30 weeks and early premature, then, you know, you didn't really have control over that. So, if your water broke or something happened, most insurances will cover you outside of Massachusetts. Um, obviously, check with your insurance just to be sure. I'm not the insurance agent, but, um, but I know, like, at least for MIT, they will cover for outside. Um, however, there are, is kind of an underwritten rule that after 36 weeks, it's expected that patients not really leave the vicinity. So if you live an hour away, we can't keep you from going home, of course, but, you know, for the most part, you want to just stay within, you know, the, the local area so that you can get to the hospital if needed. Um, for patients who, who choose to go outside of the area after 36 weeks, some insurances do deny coverage. Um, for an out of area delivery. Um, so you do want to check with your insurance if you do plan to go outside of the area. That being said, we've had many people deliver from very far away and they usually have time to get in. I think the most famous story is someone came over from the vineyard one time. So <laughs> it can happen. It's usually not that urgent, especially in first time deliveries. So. And, and I would say if you are out of town before 36 weeks and you think something is happening like labor or something you're not sure about, you can still call us, even if you're not in the area, we can talk you through what's going on and help you decide whether you need to, you know, seek out care wherever you happen to be. Um, and so we can, you know, we're, we're still available even if you aren't, you know, physically near us. So we can help you um, figure that out. I, I would just, just say to people, do be mindful, particularly as you start getting into the third trimester, that that's the point where things can happen and things can change. And, you know, preterm labor is not terribly common, but it happens to a good number of women. And in situations where people's water breaks early, that can get you stuck into a hospital until the point of delivery. Um, so just as you get closer and closer to delivery, it's best to stay a little bit closer to home. And it, it's unlikely that things are going to happen. But if you're going to travel somewhere, say, gosh, what if something did happen to me? Would I be okay delivering here? Would I be okay having to stay here for a while until my baby was delivered and until my baby then got out of the hospital if that was the case? So just keep those things in mind and, and do a little bit of planning in advance. And there's a lot of questions in here that are sort of along the same vein. So I just thought maybe we could, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's a question about what should we do if we go into labor prematurely? How do we not know they are fandom contractions? All preterm labor precautions you should be reviewing with your primary provider at all times, but basically tightening of the belly, um, things that feel like period cramps that hurt more than six times an hour. If you're before 37 weeks, a gush of fluid, bright red bleeding, or the baby's not moving. And then how quickly should we reach the hospital after spontaneous labor? That's a little bit of a more personal um, question. It involves what number of baby it is, how fast your other labor was, where you are in your pregnancy. And so these should definitely be things you're reviewing pretty frequently with your provider at every visit. Um, and so I just wanted to I kind would, of- Yeah, and I would just add on to that. I think the one thing to remember, especially for people having their first baby is that um, unfortunately, labor does not tend to be terribly quick. I mean, the average first labor is something like 18 or 20 hours. So, you know, most of the time you have plenty of time to get where you need to be. And we will talk with you as you get closer about, you know, what to watch for when, when things start to sound more like real labor than false labor. But sometimes it's really hard to tell. And that's why you know, um, we will kind of go over that with you during your office visits, but also you can call us and, you know, we can oftentimes help, you know, sort of figure it out. Um, and there's times where it's hard for us to tell too. And we might say, you know what, why don't you come in and let us evaluate things. And if you're not in labor, we'll send you home, but at least we know. Um, and generally in first time labors, if you're full term, if you're unsure, it's usually not labor. <laughs> usually but that's not always but um there also was a question somebody asked about do they have to wait any length of time before having an epidural and is getting an epidural itself painful i don't know if somebody wants to take that on 
Sure. I can talk about it since I talked about pain meds earlier. Um, so it depends. You know, like I said, anesthesia is in house 24 hours, um, and they are available, but they, you know, they're they're doing other things as well. Um, sometimes they're doing um, other operations, or they're doing a C-section, or they're doing another epidural. So occasionally you have to wait. Um, you know, it's like. You could wait sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes you wait 45 to an hour. It kind of depends on exactly what's happening in the sort of um, you know, severity of the other thing that they're dealing with. So there is sometimes a wait. And so you know, normally if it's something you're thinking about, um, you and your nurse or you or the doc and the doc that's taking care of you can have that kind of conversation as you're starting to get uncomfortable and try and get a little bit of a better sense of what else is going on in the hospital at that point um, and what it might look like in the sort of near future for anesthesia timing. Um, getting an, an epidural place, you know, the anesthesia team has to come in and do the consent with you, which does take, you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, and then the procedure itself, um, if it's straightforward, is about a 15 to 20 minute procedure. Um, they put numbing medicine into the space in the back where they're placing the needle. So you feel the numbing medicine going in and then after that it's mostly pressure. I think one of the things that a lot of people think is hardest is that you have to kind of stay still during it. So you're having contractions that are painful still, and you're trying to stay still while they're placing a needle into the area around your spine. So that can be a little challenging. Um, but the actual placement is not particularly painful. Um, and then once the epidural catheter gets in place and you know they start to set up the medicine and it, it isn't an immediate relief, it you know starts to take away the pain, but then it takes another 20, 30, 40 minutes, depending on the person, for the contractions to get better. So it is a little bit of a process getting it in place. Um, and during that, you're still having contractions, um, which is painful, but the placement itself is not, most of the time is not terribly painful. Um, maybe just, I'll answer this one last question and then we'll introduce ourselves. And if you, I'm sure that other people have questions or if we missed a question in the chat, just make sure to ask your provider at your next appointment. We're happy to talk about all these things with you. Um, somebody did ask about um, any documents we need to bring to the hospital and uh, applying for uh, parental leave for the partner. Um, I would say pretty much you don't need to bring anything specific to the hospital. It's probably always good to have your ID and uh, insurance card just in case there's any question, but I don't think that you need anything else really. Um, and the, the, whether it's maternity leave or, or family medical leave for your partner, those papers you should bring to the office where you get your prenatal care. Um, typically, we go ahead and fill them out based on your due date. Um, almost every, all, all employers um, will accept that. They know that that's not exact, and then we usually just put six weeks or whatever the time is after the delivery. And so then whatever time, whatever date you delivered on, they would start there. But that's something that we usually don't have you bring to the hospital, um, that it's good to get that taken care of um, prior to uh, labor. Um, and uh, last, there's a quick question about the shifts. Um, it looks like somebody did answer that. Uh, we generally do 24-hour shifts at a time, 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. Sometimes we might do 12-hour shifts, so there may be a little bit of variation. Um, but since our time is coming to an end, why don't we have everybody go through again and just introduce themselves again. Um, Jermaine, I'll let you start. Hi, I'm Jermaine Earl Crookshanks and I'm at the Fresh Pond office um, with Dr. McDonald and Finkel and Antonellis. And if you've seen my cat, she's joining us. <laughs> so she's over here. Hi, Chris. <laughs> all right. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Um, I'm Leslie McDonald. I'm at our Fresh Pond office as well. Hi, I'm Annie Antonellis. Annie Liel at MIT Medical. And I'm Connor Wasserman at MIT Medical. I'm Annie Antonellis. I'm at Fresh Pond. Taylor Hotchkiss, Arlington. I'm Stephanie Kuntz, and I'm mostly at the hospital, and I'm also at the Charles River Community Health Clinic in Waltham. I'm I'm a hospitalist. 
<laughs> I'm Luke Chapman. I work at uh, the Waverley Oaks office uh, in Waltham and Charles River in Brighton. And Marianne? I am Marianne Delich. I'm also in the Waltham office on Waverly Oaks Road with Luke. And Michelle. I'm Michelle Fingle. I am also at uh, Fresh Pond with those other nine ladies. <laughs> and thank you guys all for joining. I um, we're, we're sort of looking forward to getting back to doing these in person, but I think it's really nice to just at least be able to put ourselves in front of you and answer some questions. But like I said, if you have very specific questions about your own care or just things that we didn't get to tonight, just make a little list and um, we're happy to go over things with you as we see you in the office. You guys have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.